Section 13 of The Diaries, Volume 1 by John Evelyn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. 17th November 1644. I walked to Villa Borghese, a house and ample garden on Mons Pintius, yet somewhat without the city walls, circumscribed by another wall full of small turrets and banqueting houses which makes it appear at a distance like a little town. Within it is an Elysium of delight, having in the centre of it a noble palace, but the entrance of the garden presents us with a very glorious fabric, or rather door-case, adorned with diverse excellent marble statues. This garden abounded with all sorts of delicious fruit and exotic simples, fountains of sundry inventions, groves, and small rivulets. There is also adjoining to it a vivarium for ostriches, peacocks, swans, cranes, etc., and divers strange beasts, deer and hares. The grotto is very rare, and represents, among other devices, artificial rain and sundry shapes of vessels, flowers, etc., which is affected by changing the heads of the fountains. The groves are of cypress, laurel, pine, myrtle and olive. The four sphinxes are very antique and worthy observation. To this is a volary full of curious birds. The house is square with turrets, from which the prospect is excellent toward Rome and the environing hills, covered as they now are with snow, which indeed commonly continues even a great part of the summer, affording sweet refreshment. Round the house is a baluster of white marble, with frequent jettos of water, and adorned with a multitude of statues. The walls of the house are covered with antique incrustations of history, as that of Curtius, the rape of Europa, Leda, etc. The cornices above consist of fruitages and festoons, between which are niches furnished with statues, which order is observed to the very roof. In the lodge at the entry are divers good statues of consuls, etc., with two pieces of field artillery upon carriages, a mode much practised in Italy before the great men's houses, which they look on as a piece of state more than defence. In the first hall within are the twelve Roman emperors of excellent marble. Between them stand porphyry columns and other precious stones of vast height and magnitude with urns of oriental alabaster, tables of Pietra Comessa, and here is that renowned Diana which Pompey worshipped, of eastern marble, the most incomparable Seneca of touch, bleeding in a huge vase of porphyry resembling the drops of his blood, the so famous gladiator and the hermaphrodite upon a quilt of stone. The new piece of Daphne and David of Cavaliero Benini is observable for the pure whiteness of the stone and the art of the statuary plainly stupendous. There is a multitude of rare pictures of infinite value by the best masters, huge tables of porphyry and two exquisitely wrought vases of the same. In another chamber of diverse sorts of instruments of music, among other toys that of a satire, which so artificially expressed a human voice with the motion of eyes and head that it might easily affright one who was not prepared for that most extravagant sight. They showed us also a chair that catches fast any one who sits down in it, so as not to be able to stir out, by certain springs concealed in the arms and back thereof, which at sitting down surprises a man on the sudden locking him in by the arms and thighs, after a true treacherous Italian guise. The perspective is also considerable, composed by the position of looking-glasses, which render a strange multiplication of things resembling diverse, most richly furnished rooms. Here stands a rare clock of German work. In a word, nothing but what is magnificent is to be seen in this paradise. The next day I went to the Vatican, where in the morning I saw the ceremony of Pamphilio, the Pope's nephew, receiving a cardinal's hat. This was the first time I had seen His Holiness in Pontificalibus. 
after the cardinals and princes had met in the consistory, the ceremony was in the Pope's chapel, where he was at the altar invested with most pompous rites. 19th November 1644 I visited St Peter's, that most stupendous and incomparable basilica, far surpassing any now extant in the world, and perhaps Solomon's temple excepted any that was ever built. The largeness of the piazza before the portico is worth observing, because it affords a noble prospect of the church, not crowded up, as for the most part is the case in other places where great churches are erected. In this is a fountain, out of which gushes a river rather than a stream, which, ascending a good height, breaks upon a round emboss of marble into millions of pearls that fall into the subjacent basins with great noise. I esteem this one of the goodliest fountains I ever saw. Next is the obelisk transported out of Egypt and dedicated by Octavius Augustus to Julius Caesar, whose ashes it formerly bore on the summit, but, being since overturned by the barbarians, was re-erected with vast cost and most stupendous invention by Domenico Fontana, architect to Sextus V. The obelisk consists of one entire square stone without hieroglyphics, in height 72 feet, but comprehending the base and all, it is a 108 feet high, and rests on four lions of gilded copper, so as you may see through the base of the obelisk and plinth of the pedestal. Upon two faces of the obelisk is engraven Divo Keys Divi, Ivli F. Augusto, T. Keys Divi Aug, F. August Sacrum. It now bears on the top a cross in which it is said that Sextus V enclosed some of the holy wood, and under it is to be read by good eyes, Sanctissime Cruci Sextus V. Pont Max, Consecravit a priore sede, Avusulum et quis avg actib I. L. Ablatum N. D. L. X. 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 V. I. On the four faces of the base below, Christus Vincit, Christus Regnat, Christus Imperat, Christus Ab Omni Malo, Plebem Suam Defendat. Sextus V. Pont, Max, Obeliscum, Vaticanum, uh, Dies Gentium. Impio CVLTV Decatum Ad Apostolorum Limina Operoso Labore Transtulit An MDL XXXVI Pont 2 3. Ecce Crux Domini Fugite Partes Adversae Vincit Leo de Tribu Ivda Sextus V. Pont Max Cruci Invictae Obeliscum Vaticanum Ab Impia Superstitione Expiatum Justius et Felicitus Consecravit An MDL XXXVI Pont II. A little lower, Dominicus Fontana Ex Pago Miliagri Novo Comensis Transtulit et Erexit. It is reported to have taken a year in erecting, to have cost 37,975 crowns, the labour of 907 men and 75 horses, this being the first of the four Egyptian obelisks set up at Rome, and one of the 42 brought to the city out of Egypt, set up in several places, but thrown down by the Goths, barbarians and earthquakes. Some coaches stood before the steps of the ascent, whereof one, belonging to Cardinal Medici, had all the metal work of massy silver, viz, the bow behind, and other places. The coaches at Rome, as well as covered wagons, also much in use, are generally the richest and largest I ever saw. Before the facciata of the church is an ample pavement. 
the church was first begun by St. Anacletus, when rather a chapel, on a foundation, as they give out, of Constantine the Great, who, in honour of the apostles, carried twelve baskets full of sand to the work. After him, Julius II took it in hand, to which all his successors have contributed, more or less. The front is supposed to be the largest and best studied piece of architecture in the world. To this we went up by four steps of marble. The first entrance is supported by huge pilasters. The volto within is the richest possible and overlaid with gold. Between the five large anti-ports are columns of enormous height and compass, with as many gates of brass, the work and sculpture of Poliavola, the Florentine, full of cast figures and histories in a deep relievo. Over this runs a terrace of like amplitude and ornament, where the Pope, at solemn times, bestows his benediction on the vulgar. On each side of this portico are two campaniles, or towers, whereof there was but one perfected, of admirable art. On the top of all runs a balustrade, which edges it quite round, and upon this, at equal distances, a Christ and the twelve disciples of gigantic size and stature, yet below showing no greater than the life. Entering the church, admirable is the breadth of the volto or roof, which is all carved with foliage and roses, overlaid with gold, in nature of a deep basso relievo, a l'antique. The nave or body is in form of a cross, whereof the foot part is the longest, and, at the internodium of the transept, rises the cupola, which, being all of stone and of prodigious height, is more in compass than that of the Pantheon, which was the largest among the old Romans, and is yet entire, or any other known. The inside or concave is covered with most exquisite mosaic, representing the celestial hierarchy, by Giuseppe d'Arpino, full of stars of gold. The convex, or outside, exposed to the air, is covered with lead, with great ribs of metal double gilt, as are also the ten other lesser cupolas, for no fewer adorn this glorious structure, which gives a great and admirable splendour in all parts of the city. On the summit of this is fixed a brazen globe gilt, capable of receiving thirty-five persons. This I entered, and engraved my name among other travellers. Lastly is the cross, the access to which is between the leaden covering and the stone convex or archwork, a most truly astonishing piece of art. On the battlements of the church, also overlaid with lead and marble, you would imagine yourself in a town, so many are the cupolas, pinnacles, towers, juttings, and not a few houses inhabited by men who dwell there, and have enough to do to look after the vast reparations which continually employ them. Having seen this, we descended into the body of the church, full of collateral chapels and large oratories, most of them exceeding the size of ordinary churches. But the principle of four encrusted with most precious marbles and stones of various colours, adorned with, with an infinity of statues, pictures, stately altars and innumerable relics. The altarpiece of St Michael being a mosaic, I could not pass without particular note as one of the best of that kind. The chapel of Gregory the Thirteenth, where he is buried, is most splendid. Under the cupola and in the centre of the church stands the high altar, consecrated first by Clement the Eighth, adorned by Paul the Fifth, and lately covered by Pope Urban the Eighth, with that stupendous canopy of Corinthian brass, which heretofore was brought from the Pantheon. It consists of four wreathed columns, partly channelled and encircled with vines, on which hang little putty birds and bees, the arms of the Barberini, sustaining a baldacchino of the same metal. The four columns weigh an hundred and ten thousand pounds, all over richly gilt. This, with the pedestals, crown and statues about it, form a thing of that art, vastness and magnificence as beyond all that man's industry has produced of the kind. It is the work of Bernini, 
a Florentine sculptor, architect, painter and poet, who a little before my coming to the city gave a public opera, for so they call shows of that kind, wherein he painted the scenes, cut the statues, invented the engines, composed the music, writ the comedy and built the theatre. Opposite to either of these pillars, under those niches, which with their columns support the weighty cupola, are placed four exquisite statues of Parian marble, to which are four altars, that of St. Veronica, made by Fra Mocchi, has over it the reliquary, where they showed us the miraculous Sudarium, endued with the picture of our Saviour's face, with this inscription, Salvatoris imaginem Veronicae sudario exceptam ut loci majestas decenta custodiret urbanus the eighth pont max marmorium signum et alteri adidit conditorium extrusit et ornavit. Right against this is that of Longinus of a Colosseum magnitude, also by Bernini and over him the conservatory of the iron lance, inserted in a most precious crystal, with this epigraph, Longini lanciem quam innocentius eighth abajazeti turcarum tyranno acapit urbanus the eighth statua apposita et saculo substructo inexornatum conditorium trans tulit. The third chapel has over the altar the statue of our countrywoman, St. Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great. The work of Boggi, an excellent sculptor, and here is preserved a great piece of the pretended wood of the Holy Cross, which she is said to have first detected miraculously in the Holy Land. It was placed here by the late Pope with this inscription, Partem crucis quam Helena in Patrix, e Calvario in Orbem aduxit, Orbanus feed one two three, Pont Max a Cisoriana Basilica de Zumptam, Aditis ara et statua hic in Vaticano collocavit. The fourth hath over the altar, and opposite to that of St. Veronica, the statue of St. Andrew the work of Fiammingo, admirable above all the other. Above is preserved the head of the Apostle, richly enchased. It is said that this excellent sculptor died mad to see his statue placed in a disadvantaged light by Bernini, the chief architect, who found himself outdone by this artist. The inscription over it is this, Sant Andrea caput quod pius tu ex echaea in Vaticanum asportanum curavit, Urbanus v. 123, novis hic ornamentis, decoratum sacrisqui, statuae ac seculae honoribus coli voluit. The relics showed and kept in this church are without number, as are also the precious vessels of gold, silver and gems, with the vests and services to be seen in the sacristy, which they showed us. Under the high altar is an ample grot, inlaid with Pietra Comessa, wherein half of the bodies of St Peter and St Paul are preserved. Before hang divers great lamps of the richest plate, burning continually. About this and contiguous to the altar runs a balustrade in form of a theatre of black marble. Toward the left, as you go out of the church by the portico, a little beneath the high altar, is an old brass statue of St. Peter sitting, under the soles of whose feet many devout persons rub their heads and touch their chaplets. This was formerly cast from a statue of Jupiter Capitolinus, in another place stands a column grated about with iron, whereon they report that our blessed Saviour was often wont to lean as he preached in the temple. In the work of the reliquary under the cupola there are eight wreathed columns brought from the temple of Solomon. In another chapel they showed us the chair of St Peter, or as they name it, the Apostolical Throne. But among all the chapels, the one most glorious has for an altarpiece a Madonna bearing a dead Christ on her knees in white marble, the work of Michelangelo. 
At the upper end of the cathedral are several stately monuments, especially that of Urban VIII. Round the cupola, and in many other places in the church, are confession seats for all languages, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Spanish, Italian, French, English, Irish, Welsh, Slavonian, Dutch, etc., as it is written on their friezes in golden capitals, and there are still at confession some of all nations. Toward the lower end of the church, and on the side of a vast pillar sustaining a weighty roof, is the depositum and statue of the Countess Matilda, a rare piece with basso relievos about it of white marble, the work of Bernini. Here are also those of Sexus IV and Paulus III, etc. Among the exquisite pieces in this sumptuous fabric is that of the ship which St. Peter held up from sinking by our Saviour. The emblems about it are of the mosaic of the famous Giotto, who restored and made it perfect after it had been defaced by the barbarians. Nor is the pavement under the cupola to be passed over without observation, which, with the rest of the body and walls of the whole church, are all inlaid with the richest of Pietra Comessa, in the most splendid colours of polished marbles, agates, serpentine, porphyry, caledon, etc., wholly encrusted to the very roof. Coming out by the portico at which we entered, we were shown the Porta Santa, never open but at the year of Jubilee. This glorious foundation hath belonging to it thirty canons, thirty-six beneficits, twenty-eight clerks, beneficed, with innumerable chaplains, etc., the cardinal being always archpriest. The present cardinal was Francisco Barberini, who also styled himself protector of the English, to whom he was indeed very courteous. 12th November 1644 I went to visit that ancient seeing cathedral of St. John de Laterano and the holy places thereabout. This is a church of extraordinary devotion, though for outward form not comparable to St. Peter's, being of Gothic ordinance. Before we went into the cathedral, the baptistry of St. John the Baptist presented itself, being formerly part of the great Constantine's palace and, as it is said, his chamber, where by St. Sylvester he was made a Christian. It is of an octagonal shape, having before the entrance eight fair pillars of rich porphyry, each of one entire piece, their capitals of diverse orders, supporting lesser columns of white marble, and these supporting a noble cupola, the moulding whereof is excellently wrought. In the chapel which they affirm to have been the lodging place of this emperor, all women are prohibited from entering, for the malice of Herodias who caused him to lose his head. Here are deposited several sacred relics of St. James, Mary Magdalen, St. Matthew, etc., and two goodly pictures. Another chapel or oratory near it is called St. John the Evangelist, well adorned with marbles and tables, especially those of Cavalier Giuseppe and of Tempesta in fresco. We went hence into another called San Venantius, in which is a tribunal all of mosaic in figures of popes. Here is also an altar of the Madonna, much visited, and diverse Sclavonish saints, companions of Pope John the Fourth. The portico of the church is built of materials brought from Pontius Pilate's house in Jerusalem. The next sight which attracted our attention was a wonderful concourse of people at their devotions before a place called Scala Sancta, to which is built a noble front. Entering the portico, we saw those large marble stairs, twenty-eight in number, which were never ascended but on the knees, some lip devotion being used on every step, on which you may perceive diverse red specks of blood under a grate, which they affirm to have been drops of our blessed Saviour at the time he was so barbarously misused by Herod's soldiers. For these stairs are reported to have been translated hither from his palace in Jerusalem. At the top of them is a chapel, whereat they enter, but we could not be permitted, by gates of marble, being the same our Saviour passed when he went out of Herod's house. 
This they named the Sanctum Sanctorum, and over it we read this epigraph. Non est in toto sanctior orbe locus. Here through a grate we saw that picture of Christ painted, as they say, by the hand of St. Luke to the life. Descending again, we saw before the church the obelisk which is indeed most worthy of admiration. It formerly lay in the Circo Maximo and was erected here by Sextus V in 1587, being 112 feet in height without the base or pedestal. At the foot, nine and a half one way and eight the other. This pillar was first brought from Thebes at the utmost confines of Egypt to Alexandria, from thence to Constantinople, thence to Rome, and is said by Ammianus Marcellinus to have been dedicated to Ramses, king of Egypt. It was transferred to this city by Constantine, the son of the great, and is full of hieroglyphics, serpents, men's, owls, falcons, oxen, instruments, etc., containing, as Father Kircher the Jesuit will shortly tell us in a book which he is ready to publish, all the recondite and abstruse learning of that people. The vessel, galley or float that brought it to Rome so many hundred leagues must needs have been of wonderful bigness and strange fabric. The stone is one and entire and, having been thrown down, was erected by the famous Dominicus Fontana for that magnificent Pope Sextus V, as the rest were. It is now cracked in many places, but solidly joined. The obelisk is thus inscribed at the several fasciatus. Flo Constantinus Augustus Constantini Augustus F. Obeliscum Agat patre sumotum diuc, Alexandri acentum trecentorum rom remigum, impositum navi mirandi, vastitatis per mare, tiberim. Magnus Molibus Romam, Convectum in Circo Max Ponendum, SPQR DD. On the second square, Fle Constinantus Max, Aug Christiani Fide Vindex a et Assertor, Obeliscum ab Egyptio, Regem Puro Voto Soli Decatum, Sedibus Avulsum Suis Per Nilum, Transfer. Alexandrium, ut novam romam, ap se tunc conditam eo decoraret monumento. On the third, Sextus V, Pontifex Max, obeliscum hunc specie eximia temporum calamitate fractum, circi maximi ruinis humo limoc, alte demersum multa impensa extraxit, Punk in locum magno labore transtulit, formac, pristina accurate vestitum, cruci invictissimiae decavit, anno mdl xxxv iii pont one two three four. On the fourth, Constantinus per crucem victim. Or a Silvestro, hic baptizatus crucis gloriam propagavit. Leaving this wonderful monument, before which is a stately public fountain with a statue of St. John in the middle of it, we visited His Holiness's palace, being a little on the left hand, the design of Fontana, architect to Sextus V. This I take to be one of the best palaces in Rome. But not staying, we entered the church of St. John de Laterano, which is properly the cathedral of the Roman See, as I learned by these verses engraven upon the architrave of the portico. Dogmate papali datur et simul imperiali, quod sim cunctarum mater caput ecclesiaru, hinc salvatoris celestia regna datoris nomine sancerunt, cum cuncta per acta furunt, sic vos ec toto conversi supplice voto, nostra quod hac ides, tibi Christi, sit in clita sedes. It is called Lateran, from a noble family formerly dwelling, it seems hereabouts, on Mons Celius. The church is Gothic, 
and have the stately tribunal, the paintings of Pietro Pisano. It was the first church that was consecrated with the ceremonies now introduced, and where altars of stone supplied those of wood heretofore in use, and made like large chests for the easier removal in times of persecution. Such an altar is still the great one here preserved, as being that on which, they hold, St. Peter celebrated Mass at Rome, for which reason none but the Pope may now presume to make that use of it. The pavement is of all sorts of precious marbles, and so are the walls to a great height, over which it is painted our fresco with the life and acts of Constantine the Great by most excellent masters. The organs are rare, supported by four columns. The soffito is all richly gilded and full of pictures. Opposite to the porter is an altar of exquisite architecture, with a tabernacle on it all of precious stones, the work of Targoni. On this is a china of plate, the invention of Cortius Vanni, of exceeding value. The tables hanging over it are of Giuseppe d'Arpino. About this are four excellent columns transported out of Asia by the Emperor Titus, of brass, double gilt, about twelve feet in height. The walls between them are encrusted with marble and set with statues in niches, the vacuum reported to be filled with holy earth which St. Helena sent from Jerusalem to her son Constantine, who set these pillars where they now stand. At one side of this is an oratory full of rare paintings and monuments, especially those of the great Conestabile Colonna. Out of this we came into the Sacristia, full of good pictures of Albert and others. At the end of the church is a flat stone, supported by four pillars, which they affirm to have been the exact height of our blessed Saviour, and say they never fitted any more mortal man that tried it, but he was either taller or shorter. Two columns of the veil of the temple which rent at his passion, the stone on which they threw lots for his seamless vesture, and the pillar on which the cock crowed after Peter's denial, and to omit no fine thing, the just length of the Virgin Mary's foot, as it seems her shoemaker affirmed. Here is a sumptuous cross, beset with precious stones, containing some of the very wood of the Holy Cross itself, with many other things of this sort, also numerous most magnificent monuments, especially those of St. Helena, of Porphyry, Cardinal Parfarnese, Martin I, of Copper, the pictures of Mary Magdalene, Martin V, Laurentius Valor, etc., are of Gaetano, the Nunziata designed by Michelangelo, and the great crucifix of Sermoneta. In a chapel at one end of the porch is a statue of Henry the Fourth of France in brass, standing in a dark hole, and so has done many years, perhaps from not believing him a thorough proselyte. The two famous ecumenical councils were celebrated in this church by Pope Symmachus, Martin I, Stephen, etc. Leaving this venerable church, for in truth it has a certain majesty in it, we pass through a fair and large hospital of good architecture, having some inscriptions put up by Barberini, the late Pope's nephew. We then went by St. Sylvia, where is a noble statue of St. Gregory P., begun by Michelangelo, a St. Andrew, and the Bath of St. Cecilia. In this church are some rare paintings, especially that story on the wall of Guido Reni. Thence to San Giovanni e Paola, where the friars are reputed to be great chemists. The choir, roof and paintings in the tribuna are excellent. Descending the Mons Chilius, we came against the vestiges of the Palazzo Maggiore, heretofore the golden house of Nero now nothing but a heap of vast and confused ruins, to show what time and the vicissitude of human things does change from the most glorious and magnificent to the most deformed and confused. We next went into St. Sebastian's church, which has a handsome front. Then we passed by the place where Romulus and Remus were taken up by Faustulus, the Forum Romanum, and so by the edge of the Mons Palatinus, where we saw the ruins of Pompey's house and the church of St. Anacletus 
and so into the Circus Maximus, heretofore capable of containing a hundred and sixty thousand spectators, but now all one entire heap of rubbish, part of it converted into a garden of pot herbs. We concluded this evening with hearing the rare voices and music at the Chiesa Nova. End of section 13